I will focus on, 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 on trypsin uh, as uh, Dave already covered, you know, the ductal risk factors. And so one reason we need to focus on trypsin is that the pancreas makes all these enzymes with which you're familiar, and trypsin is, is a central activator of all these enzymes. Trypsin is made as inactive trypsinogen. It's activated in the gut by enterokinase, so there's a, a spatial separation of activation. And then trypsin will activate all these different uh, uh, proteases, protease zymogens, precursors, and it will also cleave a number of other molecules. We just had a discussion that procolipase is processed by trypsin, but it's not an activation process. There's some antibacterial proteins, pancreatitis associated protein, pancreatic stone proteins also processed by trypsin and in, then they become uh, effective. Uh, important with trypsin can activate itself, it's called autoactivation and, and, uh, and this mechanism may be important inside the pancreas. As you notice, there's multiple isoforms for each uh, uh, protease. For trypsinogens, we have three different isoforms labeled. P the gene name is PRSS1, 2, and 3. But also for chymotrypsinogens, there's four in humans. And we will talk about a little bit chymotrypsin C. Uh, and procarboxypeptidase, the CPA1 was already mentioned in, in, in Heiko's talk. So the surprising finding in genetics was that mutations, even though it's, as uh, Mark Lowe said, it's an inflammatory disease, nobody found mutations in inflammatory genes. All the mutations were identified in, in, in some of these, these proteins. So these are all S inner cell proteins, many of with proteolytic activity. So that justifies discussing trypsin. So more recently, I like to show this slide which describes the history of, of our, our Field. And it's really, it's one of those rare occasions you can pinpoint a year, which is 1996 when everything started. Uh, that's the, the big bang, so to speak. Even though hereditary pancreatitis, the phenotypes were described as, as far back as in the 50s, this is when the, the gene was mapped by three different groups. This is when the T cell receptor locus was sequenced, where all the trypsinogen genes are found. And that was a very important. Uh, development because at the time there was no human genome available so you couldn't just designate easily any region for candidate gene sequencing but uh, no, having this information available then, then, then Dave Whitcomb identified the first PRSS1 mutation and as Heiko pointed out this really gave us a focus on trypsin so all the subsequent studies focused on trypsin so you can see that the next I'm skipping CFTR, as was discussed. Uh, a trypsin inhibitor, SPINK1, was the next discovery. And then an ionic trypsinogen, a protective mutation, was discovered. Trypsinogen locus triplication, duplication, it's, it's not discussed much, but it was in, described in 2006. Chymotrypsin C as a trypsin degrading enzyme was described in 2008. And even the 2012 GWAS study by Dave, you know, found the trypsinogen variation, which is important. Uh, so there's a long line of, of trypsin, trypsin, trypsin in our history. So that's why we, we still believe in trypsin. Uh, even though the latest addition, the CPA1 mutation, seems to deviate from this paradigm a little bit. So amazingly, you can take all these different uh, uh, papers and put them together in a very simplistic model, which I have probably been showing for, for a number of years now, where you have a central role of trypsin, and the different mutations can increase trypsin levels by different mechanisms. If you have a mutation in cationic trypsinogen, this will stimulate activation somehow, increase trypsin levels, and this is a very strong risk factor, as we heard. You have two protective mechanisms, inhibition by SPINK1 or degradation by CTRC. And if any of these suffer loss of function, you increase risk of chronic pancreatitis. There's a protective variation in PRSS2, which renders trypsin inactive by the auto degradation. And this actually perfectly fits in this model. If you carry this variation, you're less likely to get pancreatitis. This is fairly prevalent in Hungarians, actually, and also in, in, in Japan. It's, it's, uh, you get a three to five-fold uh, protective effect.
to translate this, this sort of uh, uh, picture into a laboratory experiment, this is what it looks like. So trypsinogen can activate through auto-activation. So if you make a trypsinogen preparation, it will convert itself to pure trypsin within the hour. And this is an ampli self-amplifying reaction where with, from trypsinogen you generate uh, two trypsins by the ability of trypsin to activate trypsinogen. So how do the protective mechanisms work? So they're actually very different. Uh, if you add spink one, you delay this process. It's the same act auto activation, but it, it, it just takes longer to kick in. So in this time frame, you consume all the spink one, and when the spink one runs out, you auto activate. But this is important because as, as Dave just discussed, the pancreas is a, is a tube basically with some flow through. So if you have enough time and the juice can leave the pancreatic duct, you can prevent activation. So once this mechanism doesn't work anymore, there's a second line of defense, which is chymotrypsin C, which can actually degrade trypsin. So this is normal activation. If you add chymotrypsin C, you develop, you develop much lower trypsin levels. If you add more chymotrypsin C, there's no trypsin, absolutely. So if trypsin inhibition doesn't work, you have trypsin degradation. Either of these mechanisms is, uh, is damaged by mutations, loss of function, there's increased risk for chronic pancreatitis. Often in patients, you find both CTRC and SPINK1 mutations together, and CFTR for that matter. What we don't really know is what does trypsin do downstream? You know, we have this term autodigestion, which describes our lack of understanding what really happens. Uh, it's more than likely there's a specific downstream target. We, we're not sure what it is. So one possibility, and this is just speculation, that maybe through precipitation of the stone protein or inhibition of CFTR, Peter Hedy published data on, on this. There's, a, there's an obstructive phenotype similar to CFTR, what you, you see at, at here, CF uh, uh, pancreas. But this is not, not entirely uh, certain. Just to show you some data, even though I lately I tried to remove data from my talks and then people seem to like that uh, development, I will just discuss briefly the history, how trypsinogen mutations, you know, we discovered are stimulating activation of trypsinogen to trypsin. So really the question was if you have a tryp trypsin, a PRSS1 mutation, which is a very strong risk factor, and we suspect that you had end up with increased trypsinogen activation and, and increased risk for pancreatitis. What is the mechanism in between? And that was a black box. And then you think it could be just mutation dependent stimulation of activation. And if you do the experiment, you, you get actually very disappointed. So I will focus on the common mutations. So R122 typically changed to H, N29 typically changed to I. There's rare mutations, R122 sometimes is a C, this is sometimes is a T. And A16V is an important one because this has much lower penetrance, as Heiko showed you. So, so this would be a milder PRSS1 variation. But if you take these strong ones and you, you just try test activation, you don't see much of a difference. So the mutations themselves stimulate activation a tiny bit but not much of an effect. And we've been publishing on this for you know, almost a decade and didn't really understand how such a small change can cause such a bad disease. And until we realized, and this came you know, over the course of like three, four years, that actually chymotrypsin C regulates how trypsinogen is activated in humans. And actually Balaj, who is uh, chairing this session, did a lot of work on, on, on the mouse testing this mechanism, and this mechanism seems to be missing from the mouse. So this seems like it specifically developed in, in, in humans. The main effect of chymotrypsin C, which is degrading trypsinogen I, I, I showed before, there's a secondary effect. It actually stimulates activation of trypsinogen at the same time. This seems to be contradictory, but uh, the dominant effect of chymotrypsin C is actually degradation. As you can imagine, either of these effects can be modulated by mutations. And now if you look at this slide, which Heiko also showed, in the presence of chymotrypsin C, wild-type trypsinogen is, is, is degraded, while 
all the mutants are resistant to degradation or there's increased activation because of affecting both of these mechanisms I showed you. And they give you a very consistent and identical uh, phenotype. Importantly, this A16V mutant, which is a milder mutation, does have a milder biochemical phenotype. It's the same phenotype of increased activation, but not nearly as bad as the R122H. And this is associated with a morbid sporadic disease with no family history, and you, we see it less often in, in classic hereditary pancreatitis cases. So we had, now we have two different mechanisms. Many of the mutations stop degradation by CTRC and increase activation. Some mutations ac actually stimulate the stimulation of, 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 of the CTRC-dependent mechanism. And this is often forgotten as a, as a separate CTRC-dependent uh, mechanism. And this is not exactly the complete story because more recently we found that some rare activation peptide mutations can directly stimulate activation without any help from CTRC. So you end up with a, with a story where most of the mutations will block degradation, some will stimulate activation, and then some will have a direct stimulation. What's fascinating that the biochemical phenotype is identical. You get increased activation, but you do have mutation-specific mechanisms, a little bit analogous to CFTR, where you do have mutation-specific mechanisms. So now this is, this is uh, shifting a little bit to what Mark Lowe believes in, is that trypsin is not everything and misfolding may be a more relevant mechanism. And this was the first indication coming from the genetic side in 2009 that there was some, some trypsin mutations, particularly ones which affect cysteine residues, which are important for folding. And these had a, what we call a misfolding phenotype. This is, this is a typical misfolding phenotype. This is secretion of the enzyme. The wild type enzyme is secreted, the mutant enzyme is not secreted. And if you look at an immunoblot, you, you cannot find it in the medium, but you see it inside. And these are different mutants which, which seem to be secreted normally. So a, a misfolding phenotype, again, it, it doesn't want to come out, it gets stuck inside and it gets degraded. But this seemed to be limited to a very few number of mutations uh, uh, for a while. Uh, more recently, there's this G208A it's a mutation, which is particularly found in Asia, Japan, and Korea, it reported. But it's fairly common. And this is also a misfolding variant. So we're finding more and more even with, with trypsinogen. So none of these trypsinogen variants increase activation. These seem, seem to have their bad effects through misfolding. But the real breakthrough came with the CP1 mutations, and Heiko completely covered this. I'm not going to go through the data again, which it appears all the pathogenic CP1 variations actually do it through misfolding. And I'll skip this slide, and I'll show this one more time. Heiko showed you. You have nothing in the medium, nothing is secreted. You see some inside, most of it is degraded. And this is the typical misfolding phenotype. The assumption is that this will elicit somehow ER stress. And I'm not going to go through this pathway. ER stress is, is, is problematic during problematic folding or overloading of, of the ER. There's different signaling pathways which result in the transcription of genes which will help uh, folding. And it's, this is a fairly actually simple pathway which you can measure different components and demonstrate the, the presence of ER stress. We're not really sure why and how ER stress would result in pancreatic pathology. There's a number of, of, of theories, uh, maybe increased cell death or increased cell injury, but it's that's just like we, we don't know how trypsin acts downstream, we don't know how ER stress might act downstream. But it's really, it's a nice mechanism because the name contains the word stress and these people like to associate with disease. So, uh, uh, and this is, an, this is an example if you, if you just, uh, Put, these are two CPA1 variations we, we, we put in and if, measured BIP as one of the easily measurable ER stress markers and, and compared to wild type, which is in white, you see both of these variations uh, uh, are uh, dramatically increased. And uh, this is another marker, splicing book XBP1, which is uh, it's completely spliced and you don't see any secretion, although you see a lot of bands, but those are not the CPA bands. <coughs> 
So just to summarize this somewhat mechanistic talk about trypsin, trypsin is a major pathway associated with pancreatitis causing mutations. Most of the PRSS1 mutations belong here, SPINK1 and CTRC mutations. And in a sense, CFTR mutations also belong in, in, in this arm. But more recently, we're finding more and more mutants, which particularly the CPA1 mutations and some of the PRSS1 mutations, which may be acting through misfolding. I'd like to point out that both of these proteins are expressed to very high levels in the pancreas. So it's, it's, it's a possibility that only proteins which are expressed to a certain amount will be acting through this misfolding pathway. And the way they elicit pancreatitis risk is, is, is still uncertain, but that's, that's for future research. We do maintain a website where the, actually Balaj is helping me with this website where we list the different risk genes and if you click at any of these genes, you can actually see all the variations ever published. And it's uh, the value of this website is really there's complete citations for any, any of the mutations, which for some of these mutations like N34S, it's, it's a really a, a, a <laughs> quite a test to, to, to collect. Well, thank you for your attention and I'll take questions. Very nice talk. Um, my question is just, you know, thinking about, I mean, knowing the genetic disorders and CTRC and the, the effects of CTRC on PRSS1. I mean, can you speculate about like the gene therapy uh, for pancreatic diseases? And um, I mean, right now, as we discussed in the last session, I mean, TPIAT is the best one we can offer to the patients with genetic mutations, and that's a pretty aggressive way. But um, what is your comment about? I never thought about it. I mean, intuitively, if you increase pink levels, that should be protective or any, any TRPS inhibitor. The, the, the puzzling thing about SPINK1 that uh, there's data, partly from Dave's lab, showing that it can be upregulated a million fold, and it still doesn't seem to be protecting the pancreas after a while. And yet, a 50% decrease in, in SPINK1 seems to be increasing disease risk. So it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat... Uh, somewhat puzzling uh, gene. Again, we don't know if upregulating CTRC by a, a gene dosage would be, would be protective. The biochemistry would suggest so, but uh, uh, safe as bet would be probably increased trypsin inhibition, which, which ne has never been tested in a, in, a, in a chronic or recurrent acute uh, setting. It's only been tested in, in severe acute cases where it was ineffective. 